Hello and welcome to episode 2 of our Drawing Your Path to Success video series for the 2023-2024 Big Game Draw. I'm Darren Vaughn, the Communications Director for the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish, and I'm here today with Casey Cardinal, our uh, turkey and upland game biologist. Hi, thanks for having me, Darren. Oh, no problem. Mm -hmm. And our, our subject matter today is the, uh, the uh, upcoming turkey draw, uh, which is actually coming up fairly soon, isn't it? Very soon, yes. I think the deadline to apply is February 15th. Yeah. Okay, um, sorry, that's not so, exactly in my program, but I, I kind of know it. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, kind of along those lines, um, as Casey mentioned, the application deadline for turkey and bear draw hunts is at 5 o'clock on uh, February 15th. Uh, that's just a, a few days from now, so uh, make sure that you get your applications in by 5 o'clock on the 15th. Also, um, the results of that draw will be available a week later on the 22nd through uh, the department website and also if you want to visit one of our offices or, or give us a phone call, uh, we can give you those results. Uh, the 15th also is an important deadline for those of you um, submitting harvest reports for your deer, elk, pronghorn, and turkey hunts from last year. Um, if you submit them by the 15th, you can avoid that $8 late fee. So, um, without further ado, um, what's new here in New Mexico uh, for turkey hunters in 2023-24? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so, we just passed the turkey rule in October for the next upcoming four years, which starts in 2023. Uh, so, one of the big changes that we made, and it's not really big if you think about the year being long, but we did add five days to the turkey season, mm -hmm. where it used to start April 15th and, and May 10th. Now it starts April 15th and goes to May 15th, so mm -hmm. our turkey hunters get a full month. Uh, the other thing that I'm extremely excited about is that Gould's turkey was recently delisted from mm -hmm. the state threatened species list and that will go into the public draw this coming year. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge opportunity for four lucky people in the state, <laughs> which is not a lot of tags, but it is a small population. So we're trying to manage it pretty closely. Mm -hmm. So I imagine that that's kind of been a long time coming to get that delisted. It has been a long time coming. Um, they went onto the threatened species list back in, oh man, now I'm going to get this wrong, uh, 1974, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was some research into the 80s and to the 90s and then in 2006 the department started an annual survey and when I started, we were just doing like a spring gobbling count. We had just had some translocations of birds from Arizona into New Mexico. And then our species recovery coordinator started about a year after me. And we worked uh, hard on the Gould's Turkey recovery plan mm -hmm. and really implemented that, did a huge research project, learned a lot more about the birds. And luckily with our research and um, like the, approval of the commission, we got turkeys delisted, mm -hmm. or the Gould's turkey delisted, so mm -hmm. it's huge. Yeah, and like you said, for, for four lucky hunters, yes. it's, it's, <laughs> it, this is the first time in, in 50 years. Well, I mean, we have had two enhancement tags, uh, but this will be the first time in the public draw, which wow. is amazing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it's really a special opportunity, and it gets our New Mexico residents a, a cool opportunity of something that they help fund. So, mm -hmm. okay. So let's talk turkey here. All right. So why is it that turkeys are so hard to locate here in New Mexico? I, we, among the questions that we got as we uh, started promoting this video series is there, there's a hunter who's had success in Washington and Idaho uh, over the past dozen years or so, but he, he's come back to New Mexico. He's trying to train new hunters you know, kind of get them, get them started, and uh, he struggled to find turkeys. He's he's tried the Cuba area, the the Jemez, the Carasoso, the Manzanos. As he said, right now the teacher's getting an F. Um, <laughs> so why is it that, that turkeys are so hard to locate here in New Mexico? Well, I'm I'm gonna quick throw out too that the turkey biologist also gets an F a lot of times. <laughs> so it's not just him. He's doing a great job trying to get people into the field. That is amazing. 
So if we think about turkeys in New Mexico, uh, I, I do know that he mentioned potentially road, like right off the road, turkeys can be a little more elusive. Mm -hmm. And and that is a way that a lot of people hunt. Uh, it's access and it's easy to get to and it's easy to stop and call. So a lot of people do hunt off the road. Uh, research out of the east, out of like Mike Chamberlain and Brett Collier are huge turkey experts out in the eastern United States. And they've done a lot of hunter access versus turkey movement and call frequency research. And they found that like every half mile you get from a road, gobbling activity will actually increase about 50%. Oh, wow. So it's not necessarily that turkeys aren't by the road, because they found that turkeys use that habitat as well. Mm -hmm. But they're a little more shy, mm -hmm. and, and they don't talk as much. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Washington and Idaho as well. And I looked this up before I came, came for this meeting about why, why in the heck could they potentially do better there. If we look at like the amount of area that we've documented turkeys in New Mexico versus Idaho, they have about half as much like habitat as we do, mm -hmm. and they harvest about twice as many turkeys as we do. Mm -hmm. I think densities are just higher in some states, mm -hmm. and it could be a habitat factor. It, I don't know, it could be weather related, because turkeys do fluctuate, populations fluctuate with the weather. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, we've got a lot of factors kind of going against us, and turkeys are tough. They, for, you know, a bird, they're pretty darn smart. Lots of birds are <laughs> smart, but some people are like, oh, turkeys are so mm. not, but they are. So. Yeah, they, they, mm -hmm. they take the, the comment bird brain a little exactly, too far. Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, they know what they're doing, and, and they really do react to, to hunting pressure. Mm -hmm. And they're longer lived birds than, let's say, a quail. The average quail lifespan is one to two. The average turkey is about three to four, but they can mm -hmm. live over a decade. And they use that knowledge year to year to survive. Mm -hmm. like they're a prey species, so they know how to survive. Mm -hmm. But. So another question that came up, are, are there more turkeys on public land or private land in this state? I really had to think about this one. Uh, and one, I'm just going to throw out there, I don't know. Uh, if I had to guess though, or if I had to think about turkeys and their movement and behavior, and, and the habitats that they occur, it would be a really close call. And I think that you see on private land, uh, especially in the winter, you see really big flock groups. Like they love waste grains. They love artificial water that often is associated with like ranch headquarters or, or homes. They, they really like the protection factor of being near a house away from predators. A lot of times houses have trees and, and that's their main roof site. So I think when they're in their big groups, we really see a lot of turkeys on private land. If you think about Miriam's range though, a lot of it overlaps with national forests. Right. So I think at different times of year, they're potentially using private, they're potentially using public. Mm -hmm. So I, I really don't exactly know how to answer that question, but I think it would be a close call in my head. Mm -hmm. And where are the best public land areas for Rio Grande turkeys? Rios are going to be tough. I mean, we're the western edge of their natural range. They've been introduced into other states. Uh, they like to occur in river valleys in New Mexico. And so naturally they come up the Pecos, they're on the Canadian, pretty much those rivers on the eastern state. They don't actually natively occur on the Rio Grande in New Mexico, which is kind of <laughs> interesting. They did in Texas on the Rio down there, mm -hmm. which is how they got their name. Uh, so if I'm thinking about public land in the state, I'm thinking about trying to get on those river corridors. Mm -hmm. So areas where you could potentially be on public near private is helpful because mm -hmm. they're probably going to be roosting and feeding on private, but if you can draw them off with some calling. Uh, so some of the strongholds in the state are like the Tucumcari area, Fort Sumner, 
They do occur on the Pecos closer to Roswell. They were introduced onto the Rio Hondo in the Sacramento Mountains um, and are still surviving there. And then they have been introduced onto the Rio Grande. So mm -hmm. those areas are, are all worth checking out. I do recommend for someone who's interested in a Rio, like looking at those locations and like comparing it to the Turkey range map that we have online and then contacting your district officer because no one knows as much as they do. Like they're on the ground, they know the people, they tend to know people who have turkey issues mm -hmm. and could maybe hook you up with someone too. Mm -hmm. So they're a really good resource. So what about Merriam's? Where are the best public land areas to find them? Uh, absolutely. Um, I know a lot of people want to know because New Mexico is one of the Merriam states. They don't occur in all the states in the West. So you're going to be thinking about national forests. Uh, that they tend to be ponderosa pine uh, obligates, so they occur in those types of habitat. The highest densities will probably be found in the Lincoln National Forest in the Sacramento Mountains. Um, it's always a pretty good, like, habitat across that area is quite good. The Gila as well. Uh, it's a huge area, so it's hard to pinpoint someone to one area, but if you get in the Gila and kind of look around, that's Miriam's turkey habitat. In northern New Mexico, a lot of different mountain ranges, if you think about like the Jemez, the Pecos, up into the Carson National Forest, uh, further north, like all of those areas potentially could hold Miriam. And as we talked about a little while ago, turkey densities in New Mexico aren't the strongest. So it could be, it could be a tougher hunt, uh, but there's definitely a mirror to across the range. Mm -hmm. So what turkey subspecies tend to respond best to, to various calling? Uh, well, I am kind of going to take a little bit of a cop out on this one. <laughs> I, of course, think that Gould's turkeys respond best. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of that is because they've never really interacted with hunters. Mm -hmm. Like we talked about before, there's been two enhancement tags for the last 15 years. And so really they're kind of an undisturbed species. And mm -hmm. so when we're surveying them, we really can get them to interact with us. Mm -hmm. uh, if I was going to a species that I know that I could draw a tag for, that is a good question. Mm -hmm. In my head, I think maybe Rios, just because I've had better luck getting callback from Rios. Mm -hmm. But I've also had luck getting callback from like Jake's, uh, Miriam Jake's as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if there's, if I'm quite right on that, but I do know that both of our species, subspecies are better colors than Easterns, so <laughs> they're a little bit more fun than an Eastern. <laughs> and when is the peak gobbling season in New Mexico? So there's going to be a couple different peaks that they found um, in, in turkey research. The last study where they they looked at gobbling in New Mexico was in the 1980s, late 80s, early 90s. And they found that the first peak is when the males are first trying to attract a female. Uh, it tends to be mid to late April, so they found it was about from April 11th until April 25th or so. Mm -hmm. And then there tends to be a lull as hens start nesting. And as hens get on the nest, males get a little bit more desperate, and so they ramp back up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that second peak of, of gobbling they found was about from May 10th to May 25th. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully we, we, we get it a little bit right during the season that we get some peak of gobbling. It does vary year to year mm -hmm. um, based like I said, the research of the East has shown that hunter activity really does affect male calling. Mm -hmm. uh, so hunters can affect and, and kind of reduce calling as well. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit weather as well. Um, they found that potentially temperature and barometric pressure will affect calling uh, mm -hmm. or, or gobbling activity. Uh, also, like photo period, as the days change, mm -hmm. turkey gobbles kind of change as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there's a bunch of different factors, but a lot of it is based on hen activity and hunter activity. Mm -hmm. 
And, and what about those years where there doesn't appear to be a peak gobble? It happens. Like if I think about last year when it was windy all the time, I don't know if we could have identified when the peak gobble was. And, you know, we do hear from folks, like, you're you're missing it, your season isn't right. It, it does vary year to year, and so we hope that the way our season is set up will mostly catch gobbling activity, because I know that makes the hunt a lot more fun uh, mm -hmm. when you can get the birds to respond. Um, and I just don't know if right now we could even model how this like spring is panning out and how it could change peak gobbling year to year. So mm -hmm. I don't know if we could fluctuate it annually or, or I mean our hunt annually to, to really encompass that. But as far as it, like some people think it's moving earlier as, as temperature and, and climates kind of change. And there, there is a potential. Uh, most states have found actually that it's a little bit later and so a lot of states, especially in the eastern United States, and some in the west are trying to move the opening of their seasons later, mm -hmm. um, which not only gets us the second uh, gobbling, like intensity gobbling mm -hmm. air peak, uh, but also helps protect our hens as well. Uh, it, it, if more hens are in the nest, there's less likely that hunters will potentially accidentally shoot a hen or shoot a bearded hen, which is legal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, a lot of states are shifting to a, a later hunting season and still are getting satisfaction from hunters as far as, like, turkey activity and calling goes. So. And as you mentioned earlier, even New Mexico has extended its season by five mm -hmm. days. So that, that's another potential to get that, that second Yeah, peak right absolutely. Mm -hmm. And another question that came up is, why is there a lack of uh, wildlife drinkers that are available to, to turkey chicks in areas where there aren't year-round streams? Well, one interesting thing about turkey poults is when they're young, they don't necessarily need freestanding water. Mm -hmm. um, so they wouldn't necessarily need a guzzler in areas mm -hmm. where you don't get these water sources. Uh, turkey chicks can actually get their water from drinking dewdrops, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it actually will come from their food sources, food sources as well. Mm -hmm. So insects are the primary pult food source, mm -hmm. and that tends to be like us, where mostly water insects are a lot of water. And so as far as chicks go, you wouldn't necessarily need that wildlife drinker. Mm -hmm. uh, as I'm assuming it. it could be a question as well. What about turkeys in general and water? Uh, yeah, I think that water in the state is definitely a limiting factor in what areas that they will use. Uh, it's definitely like western turkeys will definitely use freestanding water and probably need freestanding water as well. Mm -hmm. As far as why we don't have more guzzlers, I think uh, it as far as like my management thoughts go, as far as habitat, I think we really need to improve the habitat and make it ideal for turkeys. Mm -hmm. uh, they like certain conditions, they like open areas so that they can see predators, they like these really nice roost trees that uh, provide them cover in the winter. Like I said for Miriams, it's a lot of big ponderosa pines. Mm -hmm. um, they like areas that grow insects. They like forbs, which are like leafy flowering plants. And so I don't think that water is necessarily our only limiting factor. I think if we really want to expand turkeys in some of these areas, we need to improve like a lot of different habitat features. Mm. And another question that came up is why does the department not allow the transfer of permits for people who may not have success in the spring, why can't those be transferred to the fall? Yeah, sure. I'd say that it's because management is very different in a spring versus fall hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a spring gobbler hunt doesn't tend to impact the population if you harvest your males late enough and they've had a chance to breed those females. Mm -hmm. And so you can remove more males from the population before you actually harm it. In the fall, you can take any turkey and a lot of times, over half of those turkeys are female. Mm -hmm. And 
one male can breed a lot of females, but you need the females to make the young. Mm -hmm. So every female we remove from the population is someone who's not going to breed the next year. Mm -hmm. And so in my head I'm thinking probably because we want to make sure we can regulate the fall hunt if we need to. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do absolutely get more people buying a spring tag than a fall tag. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if all those people went out in the fall that could damage potentially turkey populations. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I'm not positive about that one, but in my head that's my guess. <laughs> <laughs> and for, for people applying for a special hunt, if they, if they draw that, does that necessarily equal better opportunity for them? That depends, and <laughs> I know that that's kind of a cop-out. So, if you're a youth and you're putting in for, let's say, the Washington Ranch and um, Black River BLM Management Area Hunt, uh, probably your odds are going to be awesome that you'll mm -hmm. harvest a turkey because that hunt is amazing. You have officers out there with you. Like It's such a great educational hunt. For some of the other areas, like let's say 2B2C in the Carson National Forest, maybe not necessarily that you'll have better success, but you'll, you'll see less people mm -hmm. is the idea. Like, some of these areas don't necessarily have strong turkey populations, so we want to regulate how many hunters are out there. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it depends on the unit, mm -hmm. um, for sure, which one you want to draw out. But you might not necessarily have better odds of harvesting a turkey. Mm -hmm. But you might see less people, which a lot of people like. So Yeah, if you're... Uh wanting to enjoy your, your time mm -hmm. out in nature as much as you're enjoying the, the hunt itself, then the idea of having fewer people out there is probably right. pretty appealing. Oh, absolutely. I think that about the Vibadal hunt, because mm -hmm. Vibadal is a huge area and it's a pretty limited hunt. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so is there uh, anything else that, that you would like to add that, uh, that we may not have covered in, through, uh, through the questions that we got from the public? Hmm. Well, um, one thing I do think I forgot to mention earlier that went through in the rule this year, uh, a couple years ago when they redid Manor and Method, they removed the prohibiting hunting turkeys on roost. Mm -hmm. um, now that is back in place. So what that means is you are not allowed to shoot a turkey while it is in the roost. So you have to wait for it to come out of the tree and onto mm -hmm. the ground. Uh, so that is one thing that is back in rule this year. As far as other things, um, I don't know. I mean, if you have questions, don't be afraid to reach out to Game and Fish. I'm sure other biologists will say that too, but we really, we want to help if we can. And, and I like talking about turkeys, so it's okay <laughs> to call me and, and just chat about different things. I, if you read the forecast, uh, I know you put out a forecast this year. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a little bit pessimistic as far as turkey goes. Mm -hmm. uh, turkeys are negatively affected by drought, mm -hmm. and their populations can drop quite a bit, uh, especially if you had, like, we had a couple of years where breeding season moisture was just not ideal at all. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there are still birds on the landscape. You could still enjoy a fun hunt uh, if you get out there and put in the effort and, like I mentioned, get off a road maybe half a mile or so and, and see if you can get turkeys to gobble back at you. But, uh, yeah, I, I think I'm just hoping for rain this year and they can bounce back real fast and maybe next year could be the banner year. With any luck, we're, we're going to keep our fingers crossed. Oh, absolutely. I know I do every year. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Casey. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, we, we were able to shed some light on some, uh, some strategy here and some, some things to think about as uh, people apply for the draw uh, in the coming days. So, again, the, uh, the application deadline for uh, bear and turkey draw hunts is coming up February 15th, 5 o'clock. Uh, that's also the deadline for your harvest reports uh, for deer, elk, pronghorn, and turkey. Um, at least to apply before there's a late fee. 
uh, that $8 late fee will go into effect after that date and you do need to make sure that you fill out those harvest reports and complete them before the ultimate big game draw deadline which is March 22nd or all of your draw applications are going to be rejected. Another thing that we have coming up here at the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish is our annual New Mexico Outdoor Adventures Hunting and Fishing Show which will take place February 17th and 19th at the uh, Lujan Building at Expo New Mexico. Uh, and one exciting thing at the outdoor show, uh, we're going to have our first ever turkey calling competition. Uh, it's going to be on Saturday, February 18th at 2 p.m. Uh, there are four different categories uh, and it's super awesome. I don't know if you can see this, but they have these special made buckles for the winner. So it's going to be a really great time. Bring out your best call and, and see you at the show. Thank you all again for joining us. Um, our next episode will be February 17th uh, with Caitlin Rule, our uh, bighorn sheep biologist, uh, discussing all things bighorn sheep. To watch the other videos in the Drawing Your Path to Success video series, uh, visit the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish's YouTube page. And uh, we have a playlist set up with all these videos, so feel free to uh, watch any previous episodes. Also, this will be available in podcast format if you look us up on SoundCloud.